innovation is basically has to do three things. It needs to be something new. It needs to bring some value to someone or something somewhere. And it needs to exist in real life. Somebody said, hey, how come adults don't play kickball? And next thing you knew, we had a league formed and named it the World Adult Kickball Association. We're a fantasy sports and betting company that lets players for the first time bet on their very own fantasy sports league matchups and outcomes. I wanted to create something for everyone to remind them that they are not alone. And that's what inspired me. I'm Richard Gerhardt. And I'm Elizabeth Gerhardt. Welcome to Passage to Profit, the show that's all about innovation, entrepreneurs, and the intellectual property that makes them flourish. You just heard a few select segments from our guests, so stay tuned and hear the rest of the show. Coming up next. Want to patent your invention? The chance is near. You've given it heart. Now get it in gear. It's Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. Tonight on our show, we're going to be talking with a very special guest who's going to be talking about innovation. He is the CEO of Innovinco, and he's going to have a lot of interesting insights on the innovative process, which of course is so important to entrepreneurism. Right after that, we're going to have Johnny Lehane from the Hudson Valley Startup Fund and talking about money and why it's good and how if you're an investor, you can get some too. And then we have two presenters. Both of them have great products. So Sahil Patel has a new way to bet on your favorite teams. And my son loves this. I told my son about it, my 30 year old, soon to be 30 year old son. Uh, so listen up for this. And then Antonia Tomeo, who just has this beautiful, beautiful story and a wonderful product for inspiration for everybody. So please stay tuned. But before we get to our distinguished guests and fascinating presenters, it's time for IP in the news. So oh boy. what's up first? Have you ever heard of unicorn meat? <laughs> so I, 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 is this like canned, a special hors d'oeuvre or something? That canned you, unicorn meat. Uh, so Think Geek decided to do an April Fool's joke. So oh. Think Geek is this really wild website that if you're a geek, you can go there and think. And then they have all these products that connect with geeks, right? Right. So. Some of them were on the Big Bang Theory, like their shower curtain that was a periodic table of the elements. Anyway. Anyway, they decided to pull this April Fool's joke. So they were advertising canned unicorn meat, the new white meat. Right. And it was on April Fool. So something should be telling you that there's something not quite but right with they, that story. They did fool the National Pork Board, which objected to. <laughs> they had a trademark on, on the, the other oh. white meat. And so their lawyers immediately <laughs> sent a cease and desist letter. <laughs> And can you imagine their surprise when they found out there is no such thing? You know, I mean, come on, guys, get your act together. And so, I wonder who paid for that letter. Was it the law firm or was it the pork board after so, they found out what happened? So that came from Natalie Webster on TrademarkNow.com, that website. And her lesson from this was like, do your research and your due diligence <laughs> a little bit before you go off it. Yeah, attack somebody for that, something that doesn't exist. This may exist. shock a lot of people, but you are supposed to make sure that somebody's doing something wrong before you start accusing them of wrongdoing. <laughs> How we can top that, I don't know. But um, now a local story for New Yorkers, the New York City suing New York cannabis designer over trademark. So of course, New York City makes a lot of money on its trademarks. I don't know if Cincinnati or Peoria, Illinois have strong trademark protection and they enforce it, but the city of New York certainly does because people have heard of New York and it's another way to generate revenue. So they have a lot of trademarks. And so they got into this trademark dispute because Robert Lopez decided that this one t-shirt was violating the city's trademark. And I just think it's interesting that the city has a very active enforcement program for violation of well, trademarks. Well, I think so. that Robert Lopez who's filed complaints against other people was the one he used it for New York City cannabis and he used their trademark and he didn't deny it. He just tried to say that it was fair use and parody. Yeah, because he wasn't a lawyer. He didn't think that he should be charged with trademark infringement. But that the argument judge didn't disagreed. Work. So the moral of the story is if you live in New York, be careful how you use the term New York. And, well, and their pictures and everything in their letter. I mean, they make a lot of money from tourists off of that. So, yeah, right. I mean, I, you know, not? they license it to all these other companies that make products. So yeah, I, anyway. I want to know if Tacoma has a trademark mark on their name. 
I don't know, because there was a truck called to come. So I don't know. Maybe, Maybe not. Well, anyway, it's time for Richard's Roundtable and time to get serious and talk about intellectual property matters. I was just going to go around and ask our guests any comments they have on these stories, or if you have any questions about intellectual property in general, we'll do our best to answer them. So Tom, is there any possible way you can respond to what you just heard? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just one of sheer disappointment that I won't be able to taste New York unicorn meat. I was, I was, I was really looking forward to that. <laughs> right. I wonder if it tastes like spam. <laughs> tastes like chicken, probably. You know? <laughs> yeah, it tastes like chicken. So, uh, Johnny, what do you think? Well, I wonder if the National Pork Board ever went after Mike Myers for the other other white meat for the other other white if you remember that except i don't think tom was looking forward to that because it was baby this was from an old mike myers skit really uh, somebody else can probably mention the movie but, oh. uh, but that probably truly was parody so would that mean he could get away with it because it was truly parody well definitely <laughs> parody it depends on what the goods are so if you're using it for entertainment purposes they may not have that cover they well, I would think they would, though, because they use it in advertising. So I guess they figured it wasn't worth it for some reason. And I'm surprised New York City got a trademark on that very generic logo anyway, if it's the one I think it is. Block letters NYC. You know, that's pretty generic. I mean, it kind of means technically that nobody can use the word New York, even if you live in New York. And it means you can't use it for the classifications they filed the trademark in or anything. So, Antonia, what do you have to say about this? whole mess. It's kind of inspired me to have my seven-year-old eat meat. I think I'm going to make a meatloaf made out of a unicorn tonight so that I'm going to actually eat it. Uh, you know, but uh, <laughs> like, it's oh, a unicorn, bite. yay! Yeah, I, you know, I think that's, that's hilarious. Kind of like a Freudian slip. <laughs> So, uh, so Hill, what do you got to say? Yeah, I'm really curious on the New York City story, just thinking about all the different shops that are in New York City that have the logo, the I Love New York t-shirts. I'm wondering if all these companies had to deal with these kind of trademarks or licensing and all that. Yeah, I mean, it's like they could sue everybody. I don't well, know. I'm sure they have to all get a license, but I can't imagine the licenses are super expensive because they must have like a thousand licenses out there, right? Yeah, then nothing is expensive in New York. So. <laughs> Kenya, what do you have to say? Because when you mentioned unicorn meat, I didn't think of white meat. I thought of like maybe rainbow colored. Meat. <laughs> 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 so that was I just had a question about fair use. Like what constitutes fair use and how can, I guess, someone either protect themselves on the usage side and then on the infringement side, if that happens. Really, fair use applies to copyrights and not to trademarks. Fair use is not really a defense in trademark stuff. Copyright fair use is if you're using it for educational purposes or parody, if you're using it not making money, right? So if you're not using it to generate income, if you're citing it as part of a scholarly work, then all of those are fair use defenses and they're pretty fact specific. Specific. So if you were putting a logo on a t-shirt, the city might have a trademark that covers that. But they also may have copyright protection on it too. You can have both. The best thing you can do is just pray and <laughs> hope that you didn't even get caught in the New York logo ripoff ring. So yeah. we ran into this in kickball, kickball leagues, logos on shirts, exactly that. And we were in 70 cities around the U.S. So other people would use our logo to attract players as a credible league or whatever and that we could defend against but then they'd use our rules which were copywritten but that we couldn't defend against and we decided eventually to go with an unopen use policy but a fair use and accrediting on all use. Yeah there's certain things you can protect and then other things you can't but you have to account for that. And uh, make the business decision that you made like some sort of business decision and maybe it's better for you to get the publicity by having all these other people use it than just you know. Yeah that was really good. And so we're on to Tom. And Tom, I really am interested in your subject because I love innovation. I think all of us here on Passage to Profit love innovation. It's part of what makes the world an interesting place to live in. I'm just kind of curious, what is innovation? Maybe you could define it for our audience. Yeah, of course. I mean, in its very simplest sense, I think innovation is basically has to do three things. It needs to be something new, which is new to the world. It could be new to a company. It could be new to a country. It needs to bring some value to someone or something somewhere, and it needs to exist in real life. 
you know, there's a big difference, I think, between ideas which rest in people's heads or rest in papers in people's drawers and real innovation projects, which obviously are out in the world, uh, either making money or adding value to someone somewhere. So I guess those three words, so new, value, and real. I agree with you. I mean, innovation is great, but like I could dream up the Star Trek. What was the device where you could transmit your body to some other place? The transporter. The transporter. That's kind of innovative, but I don't think that's ever going to (laughs) happen. Maybe well, I'm not going to be the first one who tries it. I can tell you. Right. What's interesting about, I mean, a lot of people say they're about innovation, which interesting is that you're working with corporations and I didn't think corporations were investing that much in innovation and they used to a long time ago, but have they moved back to investing in innovation now? I think what's happening is, so as you said, we work a lot with uh, some of the world's biggest corporations and they've always tried to uh, deliver new products, new services, new business. Businesses. Um, and I'm not sure where that's kind of swinging to, but they're continuing to do that and they're doing it as best as they can with all the challenges that there are in trying to exist uh, and innovate in these big uh, multinational corporations. They're trying their hardest. They're doing a good job mostly. Well, innovating in a big corporation is kind of difficult because in order to make it work in the markets that they work in, you have to put a lot on the line and you have to make some pretty good guesses. And so their innovation tends to be more careful, right? They want to make sure that whatever they're going to invest millions of dollars in is got a reasonable chance of success. Absolutely. And, and especially when they've got big brands that they need to protect the reputation of, you know, especially with your background in intellectual property, you'll know that the value of a brand is, is clearly massive. And so, you know, taking any risk on the integrity or the strength of that brand is not something they would do lightly. So uh, absolutely. There's been a new term generated a few years ago called intrapreneur. Are you encouraging people in these corporations to be (laughs) intrapreneurs? Is that part of what you're doing? I have to say, I'm not a massive fan of the term, if I'm really honest, (laughs) Um, because it's kind of a, a sort of a bit of a fake hybrid between entrepreneur and inside a company. And I think they're very different things. You know, some of the principles and methodologies can be the same, but at the end of the day, uh, the way that an entrepreneur can make money and create value is very different in the end from how a large company can do it. The context is different. uh, The way in which they pull it all together and make it happen is different. So I kind of try and keep those terms apart if, if I can. Yeah. So what do you actually do with the companies when you go in there to help people be more innovative? So for the first uh, four years, the company has existed for four years now. And uh, for that first four years, it was really about understanding what the big challenges were. Uh, because in fact, my life before that, um, just going to go back on the backstory. So I spent 18 years actually working in big companies, big corporates, uh, you know, managing big brands, doing innovation projects and things. I left there actually, because I realized there was such a great opportunity to help these companies to do it better. Uh, so that's when I originally set up the company. And so what we're doing now is really to try and bring the best help that we possibly can for people who were in my shoes four years ago. So what it is, it's often about short, sharp interventions that deliver results in really short spaces of time. So whereas a lot of our competitors who are the big consultancies are doing projects three, four months, five months, six months, we break it down into little chunks and we sell little bits of help that move it forward from A to B and then come out and then go in for the next chunk. And we're doing that a lot more now through digital. So that's really where the company's going to make sure that the impact we can have is is global and scalable uh, as we move into the next four to five year horizon. So what are the top three innovation factors to master? What do we need to do to get there? Okay, uh, number one, which should be the easiest one, but it's so tough, is actually to spend time and listen to your customers or your potential customers. Because what happens in the innovation world and also in the entrepreneurship world is people get really obsessed with an idea, with a solution. And they can spend a lot of time and money developing it, 
whilst forgetting that the only reason that someone would actually buy that is if it solves that problem <laughs> or it brings them some kind of joy or value or emotion or what have you. So definitely tip number one would be uh, spend time with, understand, go as deep as you can with people that you're trying to attract and you're trying to serve. So that would definitely be number one. Number two would probably be to create as lots of different solutions rather than just getting obsessed about one of them. So really trying to find lots of different ways in which you can solve the problem in order that you don't get really kind of blinkered on just one solution in case that doesn't work, because quite often one solution won't work. And so uh, hedge your bets, if you like, by looking at multiple solutions in parallel. And then number three would be definitely adopt a sort of test and learn mindset. So, you know, the startup community is pretty good at this, you know, getting out there with rough early prototypes, models, landing pages, all of that kind of stuff to be able to test whether or not it's doing something right. But in the corporate side, it's, it's not quite embedded yet in the way that they're working. So definitely everything about quick test and learn in order to optimize what it is that you're working on. Those would be my three. What would be some of the mistakes that people make when it comes to innovation? Probably the opposite of what I've just said. (laughs) (laughs) That was an innovative answer. So like identifying identifying an idea and zeroing in on it and shutting out the rest of the world, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think when people start making a lot of decisions themselves about an idea, that's when you kind of send red warning signs. If they're deciding, well, I like it like this, or I think it should be like this, that sends big warning signs. You think, go and speak to your customer, get their opinion, because they're the only ones at the end that count. Well, we've come to the end of the segment. I just want to say thanks, Tom. Uh, This has been a fascinating discussion, (laughs) and I hope you'll stay with us for the rest of the show. Of course. We'll be back right after this. You're listening to Passage to Profit on WOR 710, the voice of trademarked New York. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good one. What are entrepreneurs' most valuable assets? Their passion and ideas. We can't protect your passion, but we can protect your ideas. Trust Gearheart Law to protect your ideas with premier patent, trademark, and copyright services. There's never been a better time to start your own business. Contact us at GearheartLaw.com. At Gearheart Law, we have years of experience protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at Gearheart Law, www.gearheartlaw.com. Don't let the wrong protection strategy ruin your business. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection and are licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Contact Gearheart Law on the web at G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W dot com. Together, we can change the world. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now back to Passage to Profit. Once again, Richard and Elizabeth Gearheart. And we have with us Johnny Lahane, who is not a rock star, but he is in his own way. (laughs) And he is manager of Hudson Valley Startup Fund. And welcome to the show, Johnny. Great to have you. Oh, thanks a lot. A pleasure to be here. Really impressed by Tom's story and actually hope we get to talk about the other hat that I wear, which is as head of research and development at Hudson Valley Center for Innovation. So, oh. Tom, I think we could write a book together, honestly. You're on the inside. <laughs> I'm on the outside trying to fill the gap for my startup fund hat, but a ton to dig into there. So hopefully we can draw you back into my conversation, uh, our conversation as well. That's really great. So what is a startup fund? It's bringing angel investors together. I noticed here in the Hudson Valley between New York City and Albany that there wasn't what we think of as organized capital. Lots of folks had the wherewithal to invest in public markets. Some folks were creating their own small businesses. But folks who were looking for a moonshot for a unicorn or even for a company (laughs) that might be 10 or 50 million in revenue need early capital. They need angel investment. And there were one-offs here and there. I know you guys have had Sandy on the show. And he was just looking at this the same time we were. So he was in Westchester. We were in Poughkeepsie and Kingston. But we ended up bringing together 40 accredited investors. I don't know if you guys have uh, discussed that term on the show before. No, could you? That would be a great explanation. So Absolutely. So that's folks who, according to the SEC, have the wherewithal to invest. 
at this level of risk taking because there's no guarantee of return. Um, so that's either $200,000 a year in annual salary or over a million dollars uh, in savings to the size of your house. And then the basic recommendations are not more than a million dollars of your net worth should be invested at this risky level. But we look at really early stage businesses that will have a chasm to cross before they are profitable, but the profit opportunity is so big that you're willing to invest in this. And usually you invest with a form of debt called convertible debt or with direct ownership in equity. And you're hoping these companies go on to get professional money, venture capital in subsequent rounds as they innovate. So let me ask you, what's a convertible note and what's equity? Uh, so a convertible note is like a loan that you're not collecting the interest on, but it is accruing interest. But then there's a trigger in it that in the future, when other people invest in the business, when other investors come in, the value of that initial investment will be determined at that time. And it will convert into equity or shares in the company. Got so it. it will become shares in the company at a later date when somebody else pins down the value. But we're not ready to do that. It's too early stage. If things go another direction, it might stay debt and we might collect the loan plus interest. That's not the road we want to take, but that vehicle is built into the legal document. Well, so you don't lose your shirt on everything. <laughs> you might lose your shirt on it if there's... It, it allows you to be in line with the debt holders, which are in front of the equity holders, as you know. But if there's nothing there, then there's nothing for anybody, even the debt holders, which can happen, right. especially in a software startup. So if a startup fails, there's just no way to collect on the note and everybody just cries their eyes right. out over a beer and calls it a day. And that actually gave birth to an even simpler vehicle called a safe note that sort of feels like convertible debt, except you can't convert the debt on it. But it puts off or punts that decision on the value until a later round of investment. Right. I want to bring this down just a little bit. This is, yeah, this this is kind very, of high level I'm, stuff. I'm already confused. But if I were, well, I do have my own startup, but I'm still doing personal funds for it. I'm using my own personal funds for it. But if I were to go to your fund and say, okay, I have the startup. Would you take a look at me and see if you would give me money to run this startup? What's the process that people go through for that? Great question. So first it's our criteria, right? What kind of companies are we going to look at? So the initial conversation is, are you looking at a company that's likely to be able to get to 10 or $50 million a year in the next five or 10 years? Hopefully much more than that, but revenue. So if that's not what you're building, then we're not the starting point for you. So we try to get that conversation out of the way. Then we look at what stage you're at. You have to have built something. We need a prototype. I know you've heard this before from other guests on your show, but really we want to see some traction in the market. If you're B2B, business to business, that means some pilots with paying business customers. If you're business to consumer, think of social media, which you're probably not going to be the next Facebook, by the way. Let me just get that out there right away. We've had dozens of folks come to us believing they are going to be. But if you're B2C, then lots of users and an understanding of where a business model is going to be, where that revenue path is going to be, but you don't necessarily need to have that revenue yet. How did you get your start in business? And how did you get to the point where you're doing all this fancy finance? Very strange trip. I actually am an electrical engineer by training. So I thought I was going to go off and follow my father's footsteps of an IBM -er for 36 years and do something in that. I ended up at America Online for eight years and did software and understood deep tech pretty well there. But I also accidentally started an adult kickball league. <laughs> what? <laughs> wait, 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 wait. There are, are there are adults who like to play kickball. But you, you, you didn't do a squid games thing, I hope. <laughs> oh no my God, games. don't even no say that games. word. <laughs> so yeah, with a couple friends at a very popular bar, shout out to Kelly's Irish Times actually, where my entrepreneurship journey really started. And somebody said, hey, how come adults don't play kickball? And next thing you knew, we had a league formed and I had named it the World Adult Kickball Association. So had grand plans even while we continued our day jobs. But in the dot bomb in 2001, for those who remember that, uh, one of my buddies who was also running these kickball leagues with me lost his job and spent half his time looking for a job and half his time growing the kickball leagues. We had people calling us from Florida and Boston who had played in our DC leagues who said, I want it here. That's, those were the most fun times to look forward to each week. It was before you could just stand up a Google workspace and launch a remote distributed business, no Zoom. But we had enough tech savvy to build our own infrastructure, our own payment system, our own league management systems, and grew to 70 cities across the US and launched wow. a franchising arm. And 
that was all bootstrap. So to bring it back a little bit to the context of startup fund, bootstrap means we funded it ourselves. We got traditional bank loans, the journey of a lot of small businesses. We never rented a physical office. We wow. only rented kickball fields and then softball fields and soccer fields and flag football fields. Johnny Lahane, this has been fascinating. I just love the kickball angle. You deserve a lot of credit for taking something like that and making it what it was. You made it work. So kudos to you. We have to take a break. We'll be back right after this. There's never been a better time to start your own business. The opportunities are infinite and only limited by your imagination and enthusiasm. At Gearheart Law, we believe the most successful companies all have one thing in common. They start with a solid foundation first. Gearheart Law has years of experience protecting entrepreneurs, ideas, and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build, or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at www.gearheartlaw.com. Our professionals will create a custom strategy designed to fit your needs and your budget. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection, licensed, and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Visit gearheartlaw.com. Together, we can change the world. Visit G E A R H A R T L. LAW.com. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Passage to Profit continues with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. And now it's time for Power Move. Kenya Gibson is with us. She's our media maven from iHeart. Kenya, tell us about Power Move this week. Power Move this week, we're going to be talking about Rick Ross. So Rick Ross is, according to Forbes, one of hip hop's cash kings. So he recently opened up 24 wing stops across the South. And he also, in addition, lost 80 pounds on his health <laughs> journey and decided to pivot his way into the healthcare industry by making a $1 million investment into a telehealth company called JetDoc. It's a virtual urgent care mobile app. It's a startup that he's decided to you know, venture into because of his wellness journey and his health and his interest in that space and is making it happen. Awesome. Did he lose 80 pounds eating chicken wings then? <laughs> it's no. the chicken wing diet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, he actually, he didn't. Uh, he lost 80 pounds because he had two seizures. One of them, yeah. which he was away, he was able to walk away from. And then another one that left him hospitalized for a while. So he decided to get his health in check and became very interested in health and wellness, which is why, you know, he wants to make sure that people have access to adequate health care. Well, well, good for him. What's the name of the startup again? Jet Doc. That's great information, Kenya. Thanks a lot. What do you say it's time for some Fireside? Sure. So my startup is Fireside Directory. It's a video directory of small businesses. We just recently filed a patent app application with both our names on it. I sort of horned my way into it. <laughs> <laughs> but it has some extra goodies in there marketing wise for people that do videos for it. The patent won't be published for another year and a half, so I don't want to give away the secrets just yet. But Under the advice of her attorney. <laughs> yes, my patent. <laughs> well, I drafted the patent because I'm a patent agent, but your heart law did file it. And we've also filed a trademark on Fireside. So I had been doing interviews of people all through COVID quarantine. Now I'm really working on the website with a website person. And it was hard to find the right person because I really just needed the back end. I didn't really need the front end because I know how to design it, but it doesn't reflect what I need it to be at the end. So we're redoing it. So we're excited about that. Yeah. And it's time for a break. And we'll, we'll be right back <laughs> after this Passage to Profit commercial moment. Hi, I'm Lisa Askley, the Inventress, founder, CEO, and president of Inventing A to Z. I've been inventing products for over 38 years. Hundreds of products later and dozens of patents. I help people develop products and put them on the market from concept to fruition. I bring them to some of the top shopping networks in the world. QVC, HSN, Evine Live, and retail stores. Have you ever said to yourself, someone should invent that thing? Well, I say, why not make it you? If you want to know how to develop a product from concept to fruition the right way, contact me. Lisa Askeles, the inventress. Go to inventingatoz.com, inventingatoz.com. Email me, lisa at inventingatoz.com. 
Treat yourself to a day chock full of networking, education, music, shopping, and fun. Go to my website, inventingatoz.com. Now back to Passage to Profit. Once again, Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. We are now on to our presenter, Sahil Patel, who has this incredible app program that the millennials love and anybody who likes sports loves. And I'm not going to say anything more about it. I'm going to let him tell you what it is. Yeah, thanks, Elizabeth and Richard. Pleasure to be here. So Sahil, uh, co-founder and CEO of Better Fantasy. We're a fantasy sports and betting company that lets players for the first time bet on their very own fantasy sports league matchups and outcomes. Now, what this means is that you can sync your fantasy league onto our platform and we'll generate the odds and specific betting categories that you and the rest of your league can bet on. So my league has been placing side bets for years now. Myself and my co-founders have all been in the same fantasy league for about 15 years and There's always week to week offline wagers taking place. We've had a spreadsheet that tracked odds across different matchups. And I frequently texted other people in league like, hey, I think I'm going to beat your team. We should put money on this. And we just figured there's an opportunity to take this offline behavior and bring it onto a fully digital platform. So to fast forward to this week, one of the NFL season, we've launched Better Fantasy to the Apple and Google app stores in early September. And we've seen great engagement from our user base so far. This first season, is entirely free to play where users get in-game currency that they can use to bet on our matchups. We also have daily, weekly, season-long challenges that let users refuel their in-game currency so they can enjoy the platform every day of the week. And to incentivize users on the platform for this first season, we're offering prizes like gift cards that users can exchange their currency for. But they can also make donations to our charity partners right on the platform. And as I mentioned, we're starting off as free to play with the NFL season with football, but our goal is to enable real money betting next year, as well as expand into all different kinds of sports and even esports in order to bring our platform to the masses. That's Are you going to expand the kickball? <laughs> yeah, we might have to. <laughs> well, this is funny because our son did an offline betting thing just like this, exactly what you're talking about with his friends. And he won the league and his friend had spent half the money. <laughs> so he never got all the money from it. Right. So now we have safeguards, right? Yes. You know, you have safeguards from your crooked friends. Yeah. But he really, I, I told him about this and he was very interested in it. So he's almost 30. He'll be 30 this month, actually. We're taping in October. I haven't done a lot of fantasy betting myself, but I know it's huge. Like, yeah. So what kind of traction has your app gotten so far? Is it still in beta or is it really out there and available? Yeah. So we have close to 400 users who've downloaded the app and we haven't even done any marketing yet uh, because we want to get our early users on the platform, get their feedback like Tom and Johnny have mentioned and really iterate the product before we scale out to the masses. So around 400 users have downloaded the app and they've placed more than 3000 bets already within the five weeks of the NFL season. So exactly to Tom and Johnny's point, we try and set up these iteration and feedback loops so that we can hear from our customers on a frequent basis and figure out what features they want us to build because we have a good idea of what's going to be on our roadmap, but we really want to hear from our customers what they want to see and then we're going to prioritize that to build for them. Wow, 3,000 bets from 400 people. (laughs) There's a lot of betting going on out there, isn't there? It's early days for the sports betting and fancy sports industry. Yep. Yeah, no wonder most of my friends don't have any money. They're all sports aficionados and they're always talking about this. But sports betting is a little different than like playing the roulette wheel or playing poker. What is the most important thing in sports betting? Is it just knowing the teams, knowing the players, staying on top of it, luck? I mean, one of the most interesting things is that people will watch any game if they have action on it. So, you know, if you're an Eagles or Giants fan, you'll, of course, watch your team and always support your team. But if it's Monday night football and you don't care about either of these teams, but you have five dollars on whatever team to win, like you just bring that much more engagement to every single matchup. So it's really knowing the players, who the rosters are, if there's anyone injured on each other side team that can kind of affect the betting side. So bunch of different factors, but I'd say what we've noticed is that by having even a dollar on a matchup, your engagement jumps up so much. Do you have a charity aspect to this? Yeah, definitely. So we've partnered with Fight for Children. They're a nonprofit in DC who empowers youth with sports. And we've also, when you download the app and create your account, you partner with a charity foundation of your choice. So we have two NFL players on there that, you know, you can make donations. And as you place more bets on the platform, you automatically trigger like a $10 donation to that charity. And then, as I mentioned, with the currency that you have on the platform, you can also just send a donation to a company with your in-game credits. Wow. 
what led you to kind of do this? I mean, I know yeah. that before you started, you had a regular job and now you're into this. So interested learning a little bit about what motivated you to make the transition. Yeah. So I started off uh, my college career after that at JP Morgan Chase, where you know, spent a few years on the engineering side and then moved into product management where I can definitely agree with what Tom was saying. The entrepreneur side, I think is one where it really depends on your organization. If you're working on a product that you're kind of just keeping the lights on day in and day out, not too much innovation going on there. But if you're building something new and launching something new to the market, which I had the opportunity to do at JP Morgan Chase was something that I was really proud about. And then worked at American Express for about a year uh, while building up the company and just came to a point where I knew that if I really wanted to take this to the next level, then we'd have to kind of start going full time on it. So I went full time on it. But I also have a great group of co-founders. So my co-founder, Will, has a great marketing and design hat. Co-founder, Evan, graduated law school. My other friend, Sean, he's on the investment banking side. And then we've also built an advisory board that people that have had senior roles at the DraftKings, ESPN, NFL, NBA. And with this team, collectively, we feel like we're in a great spot to kind of grow and, and build the platform. That sounds great. Kenya, did you have a question or a comment? Yeah, well, I mean, this is fascinating. I have a sports marketing background. I used to do a lot of stuff with the Yankees and the Giants. So I, I know that there's a huge, huge opportunity with what you're doing. I'm having an issue like just understanding the odds of it all because I was watching the T Tyson Fury and the Wilder fight over the weekend. And I'm like, God, like, are people betting for Tyson? Are they betting for Wilder? So how does someone kind of like navigate that world of like sports betting and just have a better understanding of it? What our platform does is it enables you to bet on your own fancy leagues matchups. But what you're mentioning is like, you know, you go to a friend's house with a bunch of people on a Saturday night and you got the UFC fight or the boxing fight that everyone paid for. And it just makes it so much more interesting by putting $5, $10 down on who you think is going to win, doing a little bit of research, like checking out what's their record in the past couple fights or how they've done against, you know, a right-handed versus left-handed boxer. Everyone has their own types of stats that they go to. But again, I'll just go back to the point where putting even a little bit of action on a game just makes things that much more exciting. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show, Sahil. We wish you the absolute most fantastic success possible. It sounds like sky's the limit. Passage to Profit on WOR 710. We'll be right back. What are entrepreneurs' most valuable assets? Their passion and ideas. We can't protect your passion, but we can protect your ideas. Trust Gearheart Law to protect your ideas with premier patent, trademark, and copyright services. There's never been a better time to start your own business. Contact us at GearheartLaw.com. At Gearheart Law, we have years of experience protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at Gearheart Law. www www.gearheartlaw.com. Don't let the wrong protection strategy ruin your business. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection and are licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Contact Gearheart Law on the web at G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. Together, we can change the world. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Passage to Profit continues with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. And we are on to our final presenter now, Antonia Tomeo. And I just love her story and her inspiration and her product. So I'm going to let her explain it in her own words. Welcome. Really, I'm excited to be here. And I wanted to just say that I'm really happy to be with this amazing panel from Tom to Johnny to Sahil. I loved everything that they were saying and doing. And as Tom was saying earlier, it does take a bill. You know, having this support team, having the both of you who, you know, have supported me from day one, you know, being my attorneys, but also being this amazing support system, uh, introducing me to the people that I work with today and having sounding boards to just kind of go backward and supporting me and loving what I do is really special. So I have created the Broken Praying Cross with Angel Inspired Bead with God as a symbol of hope and love and to remind everyone that they are not alone in their brokenness. The story originated three years ago when I found myself broken and alone in church and a woman appeared who I like to call my angel and she gave me a rosary. And she said to me, do you see Jesus staring at the mural? And I said, yes. And she said, Jesus loves you. Jesus wants to help you. Jesus knows you. Jesus is a doctor. Pray. 
that rosary got me through a really, really hard time in my life. And I wanted to create something for everyone to remind them that they are not alone. And that's what inspired me to create the Broken Praying Cross because it's universal. We are all broken and everybody has a story. Although I have my story, everyone has their own. And I have to say that I started with the cross and I started with a trendy modern look and the packaging is a luxury item look, but it seems to be really affecting people and reaching them emotionally because it's a different take. It's the cross, but it's a different take on the cross. It's a universal symbol that everyone can understand and relate to. The reviews on it have been great. As I said, I started with the rosary. It taught me how to pray. It got me through my healing. I rec- It's a story of healings and miracles. There's a true story behind it. And now we're going to be doing a Indiegogo campaign launching the rosary. So I'm going to take the rosary and we're going to be changing it and putting the symbol of the broken praying cross in the centerpiece and in the cross itself. So we're going to have a few different looks. That's excellent. So if you could describe the cross a little bit, it's it's a wooden cross. What kind of, it's not a chain, it's like a rope. It's a leather necklace and there's two looks. There's a double cord, a 17 inch, and then there's a single cord, and it has all sterling silver parts. It has a pink bead uh, by the locket um, to symbolize the rosary as a a symbol of what my angel gave me, but also as a symbol of uh, hope. And um, inside the wooden cross, there is a broken figure, and inside the broken figure, there's an actual person bent over in prayer. Right. So where are you selling this and how many are you selling right now? I'm on platforms such as my website. I'm on Amazon. I am on Etsy. I'm in a couple of boutique stores. And I've actually, a couple of charities have even reached out to me that I've donated the cross to. So I'm working with them as well. And it's doing very well. So it's doing very well. And I've also started back to what Johnny was saying and what Tom was saying. I started a prayer group on Friday nights. I've gotten people to come on and whether they're speaking or not, or they're listening and the word's getting out and everybody is coming together for prayer. And it's you know, just a, a nice message of hope. Kenya, did you have a question or comment? Well, I just had a comment because I was having a pretty rough day, I would say three or four months ago. And, you know, I got a little package in the mail that I kind of had sat to the side and didn't pay attention to. And then just said, you know, I'm opening up this thing. And it was actually a cross that Antonia had sent me. So on the day where I kind of needed some faith and I needed some inspiration, it came. And I always feel that God is so timely when he knows what you need. And I think in a time where we're all going through a lot of different things, there's a lot of changes in the world. I think this people are curious about faith. They're curious about something that is bigger than them. So I just wanted to say thank you for sending that because it showed up on time and really encouraged me that day. So thank you. No, I thank you. And that's what it's doing. I mean, I can't tell you how many people call me and say, someone bought me a present and it it was your cross and it's done. And they take off the cross they're wearing because they feel so connected to what has been given to them. So what you're saying has been happening to a lot of different people. And it makes me so proud because I'm so passionate about it and it makes me feel good. So thank you for that testimony. It, It really makes the world of a difference for me. I appreciate it. So Antonia, without going into too much detail, tell us a little about the difficult times that you were confronting. I think that everyone goes through a really hard time at times. And I was dealing with depression. I was dealing with anxiety, but I was dealing with an underlying health condition and I chucked it up to being a mom and I didn't realize it was causing all of these other issues. So that's what led me to church that day. And it was through prayer that I received the miracles of healings. And it's really cool that you made a product out of it because you're really passing it along in a physical way that people can identify with. But I know getting that product during COVID was a huge challenge. So can you tell us a little bit about your supply chain troubles and how you overcame them? Faith. (laughs) (laughs) But um, it's really interesting. I really just gave it all to God. And there was a lot of problems getting the product through COVID. But God is bigger than anything else. And it arrived 
on a miraculous day and it arrived when it was supposed to arrive. I have to say it was trials and tribulations and a lot of ups and downs, just like being an entrepreneur is, right? A lot of roller coaster rides, but I kept the faith through it all. And um, the team that I work with made sure that it arrived when it arrived. Um, and, and it was perfect time. It was divine timing for sure. Right. And you're working with Lisa Askelis, who's yes, been on I the am. show a number she of is times. Phenomenal. And I'm working with her team as well um, that she's introduced me to. So, yeah. Jenny, any thoughts or comments? I think it's great. Uh, I love how you've taken your own challenges and turned them into a uh, source of strength for yourself and others. I'm actually a little interested in the design process. I was looking at the website and seeing the design and thinking a little bit of the contrary to what Tom and I are saying, right? Sometimes you do need to take that leap of faith. But at the same time, when you, you know, I hear a lot of serendipity in what you're talking about. And we look at timing a lot when we choose what companies to invest in and partner with. And to me, serendipity is opening yourself up to the right timing. And I, I see a lot of that in the prayer that you've used to make a lot of great things happen. So that's awesome. Excellent. Uh, yeah, that's excellent. Tom, do you have any any thoughts? Yeah, so I, I think it's a, a really nice project. I had a quick look at the website as well uh, before we came on air. I think one of the things that, you know, from a pure innovation perspective, you know, one of the things I'll often challenge people with is how is it different or better? And I think what you've created has that objective to be different and that objective to be better in a certain way. And you've got a specific, unique angle. So um, I think those are things that are typically good success factors when you're creating new products or services. Wow, so there that's you go. a great vote of confidence. That's a great vote totally. of confidence. So uh, where can people find you and your product? Uh, they can go to my website at antoniaspromise.com. I'm on also Amazon, Etsy, and um, a couple of boutique stores. They can follow me on Instagram and I have a really great site there. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It's good to see you again, Antonia, as always. We'll be back right after this message with more Passage to Profit. There's never been a better time to start your own business. The opportunities are infinite and only limited by your imagination and enthusiasm. At Gearheart Law, we believe the most successful companies all have one thing in common. They start with a solid foundation first. Gearheart Law has years of experience protecting entrepreneurs, ideas, and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at www.gearheartlaw.com. Our professionals will create a custom strategy designed to fit your needs and your budget. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection, licensed, and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Visit GearHeartLaw.com. Together, we can change the world. Visit G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now more with Richard and Elizabeth. Passage to Profit. I do have to say that this show had quite the variety of people and projects, but we did do some consumer testing for people listening to the show, and they liked that. They liked it. <laughs> you never know what What's going to happen? You never know what you're going to get, right? <laughs> so, so, so we there started, are people like that, by the way. We started with Tom Pullen with Innovinco, and he teaches people in large corporate settings or corporations to how to be innovative, how to innovate within the corporate structure. And lots of great tips on how you can be innovative as an entrepreneur. Yes. And so you can find his website at innovinco.com. And you can find him on LinkedIn. I think the name is even innovative, Innovinco. And he has a <clears throat> YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Innovinco. So if you can't find Tom, it's your own fault. <laughs> <laughs> then, then we had Johnny Lahane. He's with the Hudson Valley Startup Fund. Not a rock star, not a guitar player. We th all thought Johnny Lahane was a rock star, but he is in a different way. A rock star in the business world. A rock star in the business he world. He did have a very innovative project that he developed and then he became an investor. You can find him at hvstartupfund.com. So he's 
in the Hudson Valley. And he's in a really interesting space where investment money is concerned because he's kind of in an in-between space. So he's definitely worth talking to. And then Kenya Gibson from iHeart, Gibson with a P, Kenya Gibson at iHeartMedia.com. She did our power move. She's also a huge help for this show. She tells us what to say. (laughs) (laughs) Oh boy, I'm sorry, Kenya. (laughs) So Kenya is here for all your radio needs and in digital marketing and she's digital helped marketing us a lot. and all podcasting the whole ball of wax iheart is the number one podcaster network now and we have used iheart for our, our digital marketing services forever and they've gotten us great results so if you would like similar results make <laughs> okay. sure okay. that you contact kenya <laughs> okay <Yeah>. thank you <laughs> <laughs> we had sahil patel with better fantasy b-e-t-t-o-r fantasy.com so If you want to get your friends together and bet on sports games, this is the way to do it now. This is a new way to do it. So So, can you accept like mortgage deeds or titles (laughs) to a a website? I have some really hot tips that I'm going to make sure I capitalize on. Anyway, and then Antonia Tomeo, A-N-T-O-N-I-S, AntoniasPromise.com. And she has this great cross on a leather rope that helps bring us all together and makes us realize nobody's perfect. And she has a rosary now too. So you can find things on her website. Yeah, very inspirational. And you should visit her website. You'll feel inspired. So if you haven't heard all of the show, <laughs> then or you want to hear it again, you need to go to our podcast, which will be available tomorrow. And you can get it on Apple, Pandora, wherever podcasts. I heart. I heart. <laughs> Wherever your podcasts are available. So make sure you pick it up and send it off to a friend or uh, what have you. Now on to Tom. Yeah, sure. Tom, what are your final comments? Firstly, it's been a real pleasure to be on here. So a British guy from Paris speaking to New York. It's a very pleasant uh, experience. I think if there's one kind of observation is that everything to do with innovation and entrepreneurship, at the end of the day, it all comes down to people. And uh, as you've seen tonight, it's about people talking to people. It's about people meeting people. It's uh, in the case of Johnny, it's about people helping and financing people. So I think, you know, that's really my message. We should focus on people if we want to make innovation and profits and entrepreneurship happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Johnny? Well, I was going to say my big word coming out of this is action also. And maybe now more than ever, let's put the people and the actions together. Uh, And when you can safely be face to face with folks, it will shake the dust off. Kenya? I'm actually going to use Johnny's word, serendipitous. Did I say that right? You did. I think this conversation was very serendipitous, right, in nature. And we got to talk about all things, right? Investment wise, innovation wise, faith wise, and beating the odds, literally. Well, thank you, Kenya. Always a pleasure. And thank you to all of the people that make this possible. Our producer, Noah Fleischman, our program coordinator, Alicia Morrissey, and our video editor, Chatterboss. Passage to Profit on WOR 710, the voice of New York. <laughs> <laughs>